Have you ever wanted to start a podcast of your own, but you just didn't even know where to start? I mean, it, it's so complicated. It can be really complicated. Thank goodness we're here, Strick. Our team can help you do everything. Intro and outro music, that cool guy with a really deep voice to introduce you, show art, show notes, audio production, hosting. We can even send you a microphone if you need one. So if you are looking for a really unique creative marketing piece, turnkeypodcast.com is for you. We will take care of everything for you when it comes to creating a unique piece that you can send out to your market. You need to be the expert in your field. And the best way to do that is through podcasting. We can create an entire podcast podcast season for you that you can send out as a marketing piece to your customers, to your potential customers, and let them know that you are the expert in the field. Call today for your free consultation. Just talk to one of the teammates that we have here at turnkeypodcast.com. Check it out. You're going to love it. It's going to be great. Here's what you can look forward to on this episode of the Nice Guys on Business. But what happens is everybody leaves with data, charts, stats, facts, and our brains are literally not wired to make sense of that. Deliver your your data through a story and you will have way greater connection. Today on the Nice Guys Podcast, fencing, fighting, torture, revenge, giants, monsters, chases, escapes, true love, miracles. Oh, no, that's the Princess Bride. Need an education on how to grow your business? The nice guys are here to help. Learn about great customer service, networking, and how just being nice can help you prosper. Now, here are your hosts, Doug Sandler and Strickland Bonner. Hey, welcome back. Welcome back, Funkin' fans. It's Friday. You made it through the week. My name is Strickland Bonner. On the other side of the microphone, Mr. Doug Sandler. And still with us, producer Anna Nigrin. Dun, 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 dun. Hey. She's now officially show producer. You know what the best mm-hmm. part about it, making Anna our show producer is? No money has been exchanged in the, in the, in the <laughs> adding of this title. <laughs> now, we did we did talk uh, earlier in the week, Anna. Maybe you can clarify. You're a millennial, correct? Correct. Okay, so as a millennial, money, title, impact, what's in, what is important to you? Because I, I always hear that titles are extremely important, uh, much more so than than dollars when it comes to the millennial generation. But I don't know that to be a fact because I've never asked. Well, in my opinion, I would think that the title only feels so much more important when you are actually doing the work that follows the title. Yeah. So I definitely wouldn't want to be called the show producer unless I was actually doing show producer quality work. So in that sense, I would say um, title is awesome. And then I would say impact is definitely even better when I feel like I'm connecting with the work, maybe uh, whether that's a part of my personality that I feel the work brings out or whether I'm actually impacting somebody else. I would say that that's definitely a driving factor in, you know, what what work really brings me yeah. joy. What, what do you think would be the, the ultimate in, in levels of responsibility? Would you like to have more hands-on contact with people that are coming on the show? Because don't you do a lot of the stuff that you do, you, you do a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff. So you, you're listening to the podcast, you're doing the show notes, you're putting the production together, but, and, then you're, and then you're doing the promotion of the show. But do you ever really connect with the guest that comes on the show? Uh, not really. I think with the new added responsibility, the most contact I have with them is uh, through the email that I send, letting them know that the show is live. And then also whenever they retweet the tweet that I do the night before as a little teaser, I would yeah. say that that's the most contact I have with the guests. What can we do to like maybe, bo- I mean, I would love it if there was more contact because you know how to, as I was, I, I provided a compliment to you. <laughs> you. You didn't hear it, but when Sean, when, 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 does, show, when does Sean's show air? Next week, next Thursday. Oh, uh, so, okay. So I have given you a compliment, but it won't be heard for about a week and a half. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you but, in advance. But, but, it's, but it's all about just making sure that, uh, you know, the things that you are actually putting out on social media, I'm like reading like your Google Plus posts and the, uh, and the, and the Facebook and the LinkedIn posts that you put together. They're better than I would have written them. So it's like, I'm ready for you to have uh, customer contact, uh, guest contact. I think that I think that's a critical component of what you should be doing now. So can you figure out how to make that happen? Absolutely. I will definitely brainstorm and get back to you on that. Yeah, we got to figure out how to make that happen. Strick, she's really good. I know she is. That's why we keep her around. <laughs> hey, who's our guest today? 
It is Mr. Park Howell. He is all about story. He oh it's actually gosh. the business of story is his website. He's 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 a master storyteller. You know, I I knew when I was about to interview Park, and I thought in my mind I'm gonna love to have him as a guest, which I did love having him as a guest, and I kept thinking in my mind. All Strickland is going to think about the entire time, and this was even before I recorded the interview with Park, all I was going to be thinking about was Strickland was going to be saying, just make it shorter. (laughs) Just make it shorter. (laughs) Less details. And Park is really, he does such a great job with with conjuring up an image in in my head and in the people that he tells his stories to. Like, I love being brought through a story and actually feeling like I'm a part of the story. And and as I talk to Park in this interview, what's great about the connection that we make is that he's sharing a story and then I really have a very hard time remembering, like if you tell me like facts and figures, like a really st- you know statistically based or, or fact-based uh, presentation, I can't remember anything. But you wrap it in a story and I can remember. And he does go through a, a story and he tests me at the end of the story. I'm like, I remembered everything, every detail of the story because it was wrapped in a story. And all I kept thinking is, as he's telling me the story, Strickland's not going to like this because he's way too detailed. So (laughs) I don't know. That's just, that's just me. I don't, it's funny how we think, we think differently that way. He's really interesting. He has a lot of great things to say and hits a lot of good points, but in my opinion, he takes a while getting there, but that's just me. And that's the difference between you and me. Like I love the books like, um, uh, built to last, right? Uh, Jim. What, yeah, what yeah, Jim name? Collins. Yeah. Jim Collins, Jim right? Collins, yeah, like yeah. Y- you read a half a chapter <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> it is. It's true. You put it down. I was totally engrossed in it. As soon as I started reading, I love his style because it is all about the numbers. It's about the facts and figures. And I love that stuff. And everybody's different. Anna, what do you, do you like a storyteller or are you fact and figures kind of person? You know, I like to think I'm a happy medium between both of you guys. So, you know, I think I could definitely do with some numbers, but then also I definitely think creativity within a storyline and, and giving those details is super interesting as well. Well, Park has a uh, has a podcast called The Business of Story, and of course, there's a lot of good stories on that. He talks about in this podcast interview, he talks about the um, the five key elements that every story must have in order to make an impact. I think you guys will really love the interview as as I did as well. Uh, the Nice Guys on Business podcast, we are proud to be sponsored by Dallin Miller PR. Uh, the podcast team.com is their website. If you click on the show notes, look at the link, go to the link. If you have ever thought about uh, really putting your message out there and getting on podcasts as a way to build your brand and sell more products, uh, Dallin Miller and his team, Jason and the entire gang over at the podcast team.com can help you just click on the show notes. You'll make sure that you, you get access to him and all the cool services that they have to provide. Uh, I think that's it. I think, why don't we just get to the interview and, and we'll do our thing there and we'll, uh, we'll come back. We'll talk about more of the, uh, the wonderful stuff that we have to offer it with Patreon and, and the recommendations on Overcast and all that other stuff on another day. I think I've had done that ad nauseum this past week anyway. Well, you know, I have not, we haven't talked about the Facebook group in a while and I want to bring that up just because it seems to have stagnated in number of new, uh, people. Facebook group, you can go to Nice Guys Community. Um, don't go yeah, to NiceShortcut.com. Nice yeah, I think to get... that's part of the problem is, is is that we don't we didn't give them easy access anymore because uh, yeah. we didn't renew the website. Yeah, we're trying to get back our NiceShortcut.com, which is the the way you can click and join in. But it's on Facebook. Just on Facebook, search for Nice Guys Community, and you jump in for free. As long as we know your listener, we're going to accept you. It's a private group, but there's no charge or anything. And it's a lot of entertaining, interesting conversations happening over there all the time and we need some more uh, need some more people in the group yeah we'd love to have you over there the uh, the nice guys community all right let's get to the interview park how we are the nice guys on business and this is our podcast let's do it so imagine being able to cut through be heard and connect with coworkers, management and especially your customers and those that you hope to get as customers, could the answer be storytelling? Well, today's guest, Park Howell, not only thinks so, but he is an expert at helping you share your story as well. He's a podcast host, an industry leader, and all-around nice guy. Welcome, Park, to the Nice Guys on Business Podcast. Well, thanks, Doug. I guess that's the filter to get on your show. If that's the case, then I'm doing all right on this end. I appreciate that. So wh- so which one of those? Because I said a bunch. So it's yep. either nice guy or your name is Park. If your name is Park, we know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're the only one of those that we've had so far. Yeah, on that show. one doesn't count. I'm going to throw that one out. I just you know, appreciate being called a nice guy. <laughs> no, and you are. You know, it's interesting. I think that um, our uh, executive producer, Mar, had originally put us together through um, through Twitter 
And the exchanges that we had just on Twitter alone at 140 characters, you legitimately are a nice person just in even those ex- those short exchanges that we had there and then on email as well. So thanks. <laughs> well, thanks. I appreciate that. So let's start here, Park. When I when I think stories, you know, I really think like the little kid, you know, listening to his mom share stories like Dr. Seuss's Green Eggs and Ham. And, and I know that that's not necessarily what storytelling is today. So, but maybe that's where a lot of people's heads are when I hear those words. So can you share what storytelling is uh, to you? Let me give you an example. That's the best way to go. Last week on Wednesday, I was at Andrews Air Force Base in uh, Washington, D.C., and this was my fourth tour of duty with the Air Force. I work with generals there, and the Air Force is trying to find a better way or a more authentic way of telling their Air Force story. And, Doug, i got to tell you, I've never served in my life. I've never been in the armed uh, armed forces, but I did marry into an Air Force family, and my wife's father, uh, who Major James Reynolds, when he finally retired, was a World War II fighter pilot. He flew in Korea, was in Vietnam. He flew 75 sorties in Vietnam and was in a a Jeep accident, rolled his Jeep and became a paraplegic. Now, this guy was really quite an amazing dude. Not only was he a fighter pilot, very decorated fighter pilot, he was also an All-American running back at Oklahoma State right after World War II and before he went to Korea. So, an an incredible athlete and an incredible artist, just a really amazing guy. I met him when he was, you know, after his his uh, uh, challenge and was in a wheelchair, and I only really knew him for about a, uh, a year. My mm-hmm. wife and I just celebrated our 30th anniversary, and he passed away literally a month and a half after we got married. He had mm-hmm. challenges with the VA hospital in Phoenix. Everyone knows the nightmare that that place was and, and passed away there. Anyway... After 9-11 happened, and I'm going to jump ahead a number of years, and we all know where we were in 9-11, it shook us all to our core, and it really shook my wife, Michelle, because she said, oh, my God, they're going to have a draft. They're going to take our sons. They're going to put them in the armed forces, and I'm going to lose them. Not only was it because of her father's service and what had happened to him, but she had also lost her only a brother in Vietnam. He was there for 20 days as a Marine before he wow. was killed. And so she said, if the draft starts after this, we're heading to Canada. I will not lose another family member to war. And she was saying a, a prayer to her dad saying, God, I wish you were here. Pop, I wish you could tell me what in the world was going on um, and why we feel compelled to go and blow everybody up to the point that they come over and blow us up. You know, it makes no sense. Yeah. Well, Doug, exactly one week later, the following Tuesday... Michelle, my wife, walks into a Tuesday morning store. Do you know what that is? It's a, Yeah, it's, absolutely. Like the uh, yeah overstock stuff. Exactly. And it's one-offs, this, that, you know, and the other thing. Well, when she walks into the store, she looks over and she was walking down the Lego or the toy aisle to get some Legos for our boys. I think she was actually trying to find a little innocence, you know, and put it back in our kids' lives. Well, she looks over and here is a model airplane of an F-86 Sabre jet fighter, the mm-hmm. same kind, same model of fighter that her father flew when he was in Chamont, France, working with the French Air Force. Um, I also uh, mentioned that uh, at the time, Captain Jim Reynolds was the leader of the acrobatic, the Air Force acrobatic team called the Sky Blazers, which was the predecessors to the Thunderbirds. And he actually, as their leader in 1954, did an amazing paint job scheme on this F-86. Well, that's what caught her eye. She looked over, and here's an F-86 replica of the same paint job her dad had designed for the Sky Blazers. So she takes this up. She takes it up to the counter. She shows it to this young lady up there, and she says, what does it say, you know, just below the cockpit? And the lady held it up to her eyes and squinted and looked at it, and she says, well, it says Captain Jim Reynolds. Why? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Right. And she goes, that's my dad. Well, Ooh, that's crazy. I tell that story, and I told it last week to the generals. To It's called a connecting story. It's mm-hmm. a way that I can connect with them to say, look, it, although I may not have ever served in the Air Force or the Armed Forces, I have a deep, deep appreciation for the impact you've had on my family, my life, and America in general. You know, and for that, I'm honored to work 
you know, before you. Well, went on and we had a two hour, 45 minute uh, story training session with 180 uh, newly minted brigadier generals and their staff and even their wives sat in on this. And at the very end of it, I got one of the greatest honors of my life. Well, this old bold general in the back of the room raises his hand and he says, uh, Park, I'd like to uh, make a clarification to the first story you told. And what I was really bracing myself for, Doug, was that <laughs> I probably mispronounced a squadron name or I blew the F-86 reference or something. I found yeah. that you know, colonels or generals are very particular about this sort of thing. But then he continues. He goes, you have served, and you served with great honor, and for that I commend you just by being here. Wow. So that is the power of story. And what was so great is you're telling this story, and I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm listening and I'm watching your wife actually walk down the aisles of of Tuesday morning, and I'm, and I'm watching your father-in-law, your your deceased father-in-law, actually in the cockpit, proud to to serve and fly the, all of those sorties that he was that he served over in uh, in the war, and and I'm and I'm looking at these innocent kids that are just about to get to get their Lego toys. So uh, those things become extremely real to me when you when you share them in a form of a story and I, so my concern is this and and again I'm not uh, believe mm-hmm. me I'm not attacking anything that you just said I think it's great but I'm let me play the other side of it for a second and just help me because I think this is oftentimes where people find themselves especially when we are detailed people or when we are people that just want the facts When you run into somebody that says, I just want the facts, and you start telling them stories, do you find that people think that, why are you telling me all of these stories? Does that ever ever come into the the case? I'm not saying it has to, but does that happen to you? It doesn't happen to me. It does happen to people typically because they aren't telling the right story or they are yammering <laughs> right. on and on and on. You right. Now, I told you a bit of an epic story there that t- takes a little bit longer than you need to take. Um, it just happened last week and it was a point in time. But you can come in and you have to know your audience in a godlike way, as they say in Hollywood, you have to know who that protagonist is that who is sitting across from you and what story they're, what journey they're on. But you can tell short stories. You don't, they can be two sentence stories. They can be one minute stories. But here's right. the deal. Nobody ever teaches you how to do this in business. And yet, our minds are absolutely, people say they are hardwired for story. I say they're pre-wired for story. We come out at birth and we're pre-wired to make sense of the madness of being human beings. And we use story, the events that, that stories communicate, to become clear about what's happening around for the basic, basic thing of survival. It's all simply about survival. What do you get when you have the guy? And again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I'm not trying to play the contrarian. I just because we we got into it and we got into it kind of quickly. I love stories because mm-hmm. for me, and and uh, you, you probably don't know if you haven't had a chance to listen to any of our episodes. I'm a very detailed guy. So when my co-host and I start having a story, he's like, "Get to the effing point." <laughs> That's what he's basically saying to me, and I'm thinking. I don't, it's not about the point. It's about how did we arrive here? So I always think about that guy that's sitting out in the audience. And again, you got to know your crowd. And I 100% agree with what you're saying. I I, I always think Mm -hmm. about that guy that's out of my audience saying, I I don't care about the pain. Just show me the baby, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. So what do you say to people that that say things like that when it comes to storytelling? And again, I'm not attacking storytelling. I'm just trying to get it. No, not at all. Because I I, I love it. I love it. I tell them... uh, Tell a story, tell an anecdote, tell the outcome. Now, the baby is the outcome. So so share the baby first. But the data was the pain that they had to go through to have the baby. But right. what happens is everybody leaves with data, charts, stats, facts, and our brains are literally not wired to make sense of that. But start with a story, deliver it through stats and fact, you know, or deliver your, your data through a story and you will have way greater connection. It can be something as simple as a, a then and button therefore, which is no more than two or three sentences long. Yeah. And you can show up and, and that's a, a really great process that I learned from Dr. Randy Olson in his book, Houston, We Have a Narrative, Why Science Needs Story. And it's breaking it down to basic argument, set up problem resolution. You can do that with one of these data dogs. You can do that in 20 seconds, but at least you've connected with them emotionally when you do it, and then you use the data to back that up. 
I, I love the connection that I have. As a professional speaker, I always start my keynote speeches with a story. I mean, the point of the keynote is is really the stories, and you're going to make an, emo- an emotional impact uh, as a result of, of telling those stories, and you're going to build the connection. So I think they are extremely important to tell multiple stories as a part of um, any speech that you're delivering, because I think that then it, it puts, it put, you know, it's... Uh, I, I I think I was listening to something that you were one of your guests was saying on one of you, on your podcast, and we'll talk about the, that in a couple of moments. Just about um, you know, stop talking to me about the facts. Tell me, tell me the. Mm-hmm. I want some of the fluff. Make it relatable. It's not about the facts. It's about the it's about the story that makes you that builds the connection with your uh, with your audience, even if that audience is just one person across the table from you that you're negotiating with. It. And and it, that brings me to a point. I'm sorry. I I know that I'm I'm all over the place right no, now, no, but no. I'm excited about this topic. I it really when I heard you're coming on the show, I started doing a whole bunch of research on you, and I'm like, gosh, this guy's really cool. I really like what he's all about. <laughs> I I will shut up and let you talk in a second. I promise. <laughs> so, tell me, make the connection though between storytelling and the bottom line. So talk about that for a second because I think that that's where my audience, our Funkin' fans, our nice guy communities will will really connect with what the impact of storytelling can share. You know, in their business. Okay, um, let's go back to this idea of turning data into drama. And how imperative it is. I know people want to just cut to the bottom line and make me a bunch of money. And that is the core problem with most business minds. They want to do a setup, act one, and go right to act three hereby without taking the time. And it's not fluff, without taking the time to connect on a human level. So just think about it this way. Data does one of three things. Data either reports on an event that has happened or monitors an event that is currently happening, or attempts to predict an event in the future. But our minds, our reptilian brains, our subconscious only cares about the event. Why do you think that is? I don't know. Because they can see it in their mind? It's a story being built? I'm, I'm not sure. It's even more primal than that. Events can kill us. Data can't. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's very true. Yeah, that's very true. The analytics aren't going to kill you, but the the dinosaur eating your eating your uh, head off will. Yeah. So when you think <laughs> about the weather, you think about the temperature yesterday. Data reported on what it was yesterday on Sunday. Um, data today is monitoring what's happening today, and then tomorrow it's going to predict something else. You know, here's what we think is going to happen. But what do you do with that data input? You decide on what you're going to wear. You know, what you're going to do? Are you going to be outside, inside? Is that picnic going to be canceled? Is it not going to be canceled? Our brains literally are hardwired for or pre-wired for the uh, story about the event. It literally is what has evolved us from cavemen to consumers. But in business, nobody ever teaches business people to take a deep breath and think about how you are emotionally communicating and connecting with your audiences. Data never does that. Story does. And then once you've captured their hearts, once you've captured their intuitive minds, then you deliver them the data so that they can justify the purchase with their heads. But we do just the opposite. And that's yeah. not nearly as powerful as selling to the heart and justifying the purchase with their heads. Help me for a second. If somebody that is listening to this says, I, I love the idea of listening to stories, but you know, Park, I could never tell a story the way the way you just did. So how do you how is it not just for a master communicator like you? Well, everybody, I always say that uh, every single one of us were at the tops of our storytelling games in kindergarten. Think about it. We lived <laughs> yeah. them. We told them. We daydreamed about them. It's we believed where, them. We believe. We, we lived. Totally we're in them. them. We're in them. Yeah. Whatever it is, even the even the false stuff. Dude, I, I went to a, a, a parochial school through the eighth grade, St. Brendan's up in Seattle, Washington. And we would have to go to, you know, confession every Thursday. Um, you know, was it once or every, every couple of weeks? Anyways, I would get into that confessional and I was like in there and in there and going on and on and on. And when I came out, my buddies would say, geez, Mark, what'd you do last week? You were in there a long time. <laughs> I said, I had a captive audience. I could tell them anything I wanted. <laughs> So I judged the powers of my stories depending on what my penance were. You know, I was a a nice guy. I wasn't doing all this stuff, but I was having fun. Bottom line was we are absolute storytelling animals. And there's a wonderful book 
by that title written by Jonathan Gottschall. And he covers this intersection of, of brain structure and story structure and how the inner two are, how the two are absolutely interrelated. And for me, a guy that's been in the advertising marketing business for over 30 years, it was a huge aha. And it's like, oh, my God, we have been focused on features and functions with a little bit of benefit attached to it when we have ignored the emotional impact of telling stories about what we make happen in people's lives. So that's the that's a critical part. One of the things that you uh, that you share, and I can't remember again if it was on your podcast or just as I was reading this about you, as in, or maybe it was on one of your YouTubes that you talk about anybody can build their story in thirty minutes. Is that was that you that said that, or am I just making that up? I can't re- I can't recall. Well, I think you could build a story in thirty seconds. Um, <laughs> it might you know thirty minutes, thirty hours, thirty days, thirty years. It's I it it comes back to here's some elements, and I learned this from the great guys out in Melbourne, Australia at anecdote. Um, and they, and they have a, a storytelling for leaders program that I have since learned and am certified on and I teach. And I love this these five simple points if you're thinking about a story and you can wrap any story around this. But when you use these little elements to story, your audience says, whoa, Doug's telling me a story. Now, the okay. very first one that is so powerful is give it a time stamp. So I started this show with you. When did I tell you I was at Andrews Air Force Base? Oh, geez. Uh, Last week. Last week. Last Wednesday. Timestamp. As soon as I say, Doug, last Wednesday, boom, your brain goes, oh, yeah, telling me a story. And and then I gave you a location stamp last Wednesday Uh, at Andrews Air Force Base. Yeah, Washington, D.C. And then I, because I'm, that's where I am. I'm in Washington. So I'm like, okay, not uh, far from me. Okay. So now we've got this connection. So you're like, oh, okay. Then what happened? Story guy at Andrews Air Force Base. What are you doing out there? Then you introduce a character. In this case, uh, the character is really the bull, the, the general up there uh, that, that said, hey, Park, you know, um, I, I want to correct you on your story. I kind of introduce him late after introducing a couple of other characters. But the main point is and that gets a little complex. Just introduce a single character. Is this story about you, about someone you saw, about a client, about mm-hmm. whomever? And I can tell you a very quick one after this. Then have action. So what happened? Something had to have ha- ha- um, happened to make this a story to propel it forward. Find a surprise. There's a surprising outcome in that action, that aha moment. And then wrap it all in a business point. What's your freaking point you're trying to make here? <laughs> So that, that's great. I, I was typing as you were saying that because I'm like, okay, now I want to be able to now I want to be able to do that with the with the stories that I tell. Those are five great things. And I'm thinking back to the stories that I tell as a part of my keynotes. And each one of those has a timestamp, has a location, has a character, has a surprising outcome. And then of course, you got to make a point because if you don't make a point, then you've you're going to potentially lose mm-hmm. any relevance that you have with the audience that you're talking to. Yeah. And and Doug, what I want your listeners to really take away from this is you're not fabricating stories and you're not telling, you know, fables necessarily. You are telling true stories true that mm-hmm. you have experienced that or that you have heard about. You are not making these things up. And so find stories that you've experienced in your personal life or your professional life that have a really interesting business point that is going to be relevant to your audience sitting across from you. And then you can tell them that story in, in 140 characters or, you know, one minute or less. Or if you've got the time to expound on it, you can take several minutes depending on what you're trying to achieve. But the bottom line is you are trying to hook them emotionally so that then you can deliver the data intellectually and it will actually connect. So we live in a we live in a really big marketing world nowadays, especially with technology the way that it is. And the word brand comes up a huge amount of time, so much more than than the word story. So can you share for the for the um, just for the point of clarification the difference between story and brand? Well, a brand is an entity, um, and you're trying to make it as human as possible, even though a lot of brands struggle to do that. So a brand, just think of it as an entity. A story is how you communicate and connect the experiences that an audience, a customer, an employee, a a shareholder, a stakeholder has with the entity of the brand. You are using stories to talk about those events and those experiences to invite them in to try it themselves. Then the hope, of course, is you deliver on those stories and those experiences, and then your audiences and your customers start making your story their story. And then the greatest thing in the world happens, 
is word of mouth marketing. They start sharing it with the rest of the world, <laughs> right? And that's what you're ultimately looking for. That's why I call it story marketing. You know, we have content marketing, which to me is very still high level abstract. Everything is content, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Right, right, it's content, right. content, content. Well, I like to boil it down to story marketing because I think, you know, a lot of listicles and a lot of infographics and that sort of thing are kind of nice when you're looking at them, but they're not very memorable. And you certainly don't repeat them. But a story is extraordinarily memorable, and you can repeat it time and time again because we've done the heavy lifting for our audiences of weaving the event together with the outcome. Of what do yeah. you get by, you know, by getting involved? And you do that through the story. So a lot of the stories we tell as brand storytellers are fictional at first until your customer actually experiences them. Then they become nonfiction. And that's the thing is you don't want that experience to be fictional as well as you've got to right. back up your stories. They're that powerful. So Nice Guy Community Park has a uh, has a podcast called The Business of Story. And in the intro, a part of the uh, a part of the intro that you have, you talk about, I think there's a quote in there that says, drop the PowerPoint, start with your story. Can you can you share with our community? Again, I think we've we've covered this, but I think it's really important to to emphasize this. Why is PowerPoint maybe not the way to go and the story is the way to go? Well, you know, PowerPoints don't kill audiences. Presenters wielding PowerPoints <laughs> riddled with bullets kill audiences. So yeah. PowerPoints are just a medium. They're nothing more, but they have become total and complete crutches for presenters. So they put all their deck on there. They put all of their words, all of their uh, bullet points on there simply so the presenter can stay on track with what they're trying to present. Now, if you forget that, throw that out. And just think of PowerPoint as a medium to amplify what it is you're trying to tell mm -hmm. and do your presentation without any visuals and without any visual aids. And you will see that even when you start wrapping and weaving story into your presentations, it makes it easier for you to present the information. And it certainly makes it easier for your audiences to accept it. Once you get to that point where you've got your outline, your script down, then create a PowerPoint. But you'll find in my presentations, no bullets. Uh, very, very few words only used to back up what I'm trying to say, but I typically have f single photos, animations, and some video, depending on what I'm trying to get across, but it's always, always used to amplify what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to share with the audience. So people rely on PowerPoints as speaker decks to help them get through their presentation. When story will help them get through their presentation, PowerPoint is simply a medium that should be whatever amplifies what they're trying to say. I guess I got to learn my my uh, my program even a little bit better and even learn my stories a little better. It's hard for me to keep on track for if I'm delivering like a 90 minute or a two hour long program, mm -hmm. I, I have a tough time just keeping just keeping straight. So I, I guess I just need to either learn my program better or use better uh, like leader slides or leader photos. I, I don't like to use bu bullet points and I really avoid them as a part. I, I love using pictures and making them funny and, you know, weaving that into my, my presentation. Sometimes it's a little bit challenging though just to keep keep straight and keep on track <laughs> do you find that the case too or do you kind of just you're able to just go i yeah i don't because i literally approach my presentations um like a screenwriter approaches a movie i break it up into three acts i don't get into the whole thing about tell them what you're going to tell them tell yeah. them it and then repeat what you <laughs> tell told them, them i don't do that right. i think that is like just like brain dead but I, what i do is i approach it as a three act structure Act one, and I use my story cycle process, the 10 steps within that three acts, 10 chapters, if you will, and I take them by the hand and I can do it from 20 minutes to three hours, depending on you know who the audience is and what they've asked for. But li literally, Doug, I will do my setup. My Let's just say it's a, a an hour-long presentation. And by uh -huh. the way, I try to make them as interactive as possible so people are really working their stories as they go through it. I'm just not up lecturing. But I will, at, in a 10-hour presentation, act one, my setup. Up. Why is story more important now than ever to connect and ri rise above the noise of the attention deficit economy and connect? Um, then that typically takes me 12 to 15 minutes. And in there, I will um, have an exercise that people can do and they, they will see how their brains 
automatically make up stories without them even trying to. And I do it with a fun little video thing. And then I break into act two, which is always longer because that's where, all right, now let me show you an intentional approach to how you can use this storytelling and everything you do. I walk them through it and they are working through, they're doing the heavy lifting of working through their stories. I get some of them up on stage and they're presenting and that kind of thing. And then my act three or the close literally is like the last seven minutes. It's the short because all I'm trying to do is amplify what my points are at the end of it and you know basically demonstrate look you just leveled up as a storyteller in one hour now if you do this every day and work on it you're gonna get even better so I take the the three act structure boil it down to my 10 step story cycle process and that's what keeps me on track throughout the whole thing and the really interesting thing that I learned literally from Hollywood with this Doug is your audience realizes Um, subconsciously that they're part of a story, that there's actually a journey going on here. They don't realize it till afterwards. And I talked to some of the people that sit in it after the fact. And I said, you realize I literally just took you through a play. (laughs) And they're going, God, you're right. You did. (laughs) Um, But that's the most fabulous thing about storytelling and story structure. It has been around since the beginning of time. It's how we make sense of the madness of being human beings and marketers that use it um, are, are just ahead of the game, especially in this day and age of abundance and the cacophony of communication that we all have to deal with and compete within. Clarify for a second, because I, I have a hard time re- um, kind of understanding when you share stories and when it's not appropriate to share stories. For example, you have a meeting coming up that, uh, that literally should be a five-minute meeting as you're having a conversation with somebody. Are you still using stories as a part of the communication from one coworker to another? Or, or is there a time when you just say, you probably now it's second nature to you. So you, they, your stories probably just come out and you probably just have a story for almost every instance or something is a trigger for a story for you. Is that the case in every conversation that we have or do people say, oh crap, here comes a storytelling guy again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not again, That's a really I'm, no, good offense, question. Yeah. no <laughs> offense to what you're saying, but when do you leave it on the table and just say, dude, it's over. Stop telling the stories. Yeah, it, it, it's whatever your strategy is for that interaction. Now, if you're going down the hall and you bump into a colleague and they're on <laughs> deadline and something's going on, you're probably not going to bust out and riff on a story. You're not. Right. But if you are trying to see them your way and you have an opinion or an aspersion about something, that opinion is not going to connect unless you first share a little bit of a story as to what the outcome might look like or why this is important. Right. So it just really, really depends. And the best thing I think your listeners can do is for the next week, listen. Don't tell stories. Don't do anything. Whenever they're in a in a meeting or they're having drinks or they're sitting at the dinner table or whatever, just listen to the people going on, you know, to the conversation going on around you and identify the bores in the room <laughs> and the people that like truly engage you. And what they're going to find is the storytellers engage yeah. you, even the smallest oh stories. Yes, totally. I, I feel the same way. I'm one. I, I always thought maybe that's just me. Maybe I just uh, again. I'll go to my my uh, my co-host for a second. We, we he thinks much differently than I do. And when it comes to things like audio editing, he can actually visualize the audio play in his head. When it comes to okay, I'm going to take this section out. He's very. I think analytical. He's a report and da- data analyst for uh, for a company, and and I am so right brained. I'm like, I just want to see flowers and XOs and XOs, <laughs> you know. So I I always just thought it was me that that is the one. You know, some people are j- just the facts, ma'am. I just want to get the yeah. facts, and and some people are very uh, creative. I always compare storytellers to the creatives in the world. Well, and to demonstrate the power of story, I was in Vegas in April working with a bunch of accountants. And they were just the facts, ma'am. And I I busted out literally a salmon fishing story, and I loaded it with 15 data points as I told them this true salmon fishing story that I I experienced with my brothers back in- What's a data point? Sorry, just give me a data point again. Uh, A data point. In this case, we were were fishing in uh, June of 2008. That's a data point. Oh, Um, okay. Okay. I got it. Got it. Okay. Sorry. um, Up in the northern tip of Vancouver Island. Okay. That's so that sort of thing. Okay. So going okay, on, gotcha. on, talking about the kind of fish we're after. The I, ta- I talked about a cliff coming out of the sea, the tide. I mean, I went on and on and on. I told the story, and it took about five minutes to tell the story, and they just kind of looked at me like, okay. I did have a business point at that point of the presentation. 
Two hours later, when I came back on, I was sharing the stage with a couple of other folks. I asked the room, can you remember you know, where we were fishing, when we were fishing, what we were fishing for, how many miles we had traveled. I mean, I went down it. They, that room was able to identify every single data point that I had in there because it was couched in a story. Had I gone through a bulleted list with those data points, it it was out of context. It wouldn't mean anything. But because they could wrap that data around an event through a story, they all sit there, sat there in amazement when they were able to rattle off all this, even right down to how big of a fishing boat we were on. Right, right. The, now, the size of the outboard motor. I mean, these things, that it just connected with them because of story. So you have this uh, this podcast. Let's chat about that for just a quick oh, yeah. second. And we have a, a couple more moments to go before we got to wrap. But uh, I want to I talk about your podcast it's called The Business of Story. So how did you get into the podcast? Well, I can only imagine how you got into the <laughs> podcasting space. But what do you love about using this so much? Is it just another channel for you to be able to share more stories with people? That's secondary. Uh, by running The Business of Story podcast, I get to meet great people like you and other folks that have been on our show that I would never have had an opportunity or an excuse to get on and chat with. So yeah. first and foremost, the personal gain I've gotten from it is probably way greater than any gain my listeners have got from it. But having said that, then what I try to do is bring as much value by finding these story artists from around the world so our listeners can help you know craft and tell better stories that sell. And I came out of it because I was in, in the advertising world for 30 years. I had my own ad agency for 20 years, was not particularly enamored with it the last five or six years. The, the advertising just wasn't working anymore. I learned about story when our middle son went to Hollywood. He went to Chapman University, got his degree in film, and he's been in Hollywood ever since. And so I lived vicariously through him as well as paid for his textbooks, learned everything I could that Hollywood knew about storytelling. And that's when I got my big aha moment that took me deep, deep, deep into studying why does story work for humans and how can leaders and brands do a better job of connecting through the power of story. So when the podcast came out two years ago, I just uh, recorded my 105th show, I guess I it is. I saw that. I saw yeah. that. Congratulations. That's great. You, you, you went into the triple digits. You got to love that. It, I, I love it. And it's just me and my fascination exploring story and finding really great people that are willing and generous to share their insights. And so I record it and share it with my world and we just have had a blast we've had over like a quarter million downloads it's, it's just great fun that is uh, that is wonderful, and and it is a wonderful podcast. And and believe it or not, uh, Nice Guy Community, I, I'm sure you do believe this. There are a number of stories that are told. I was listening to several of the episodes before <laughs> I had Park on on the uh, on the show today, and uh, they're all they all were really good. And and it's so good because you kind of sit back and listen, and you just kind of pepper it with your uh, with your points, but you let your your guests talk a lot more than I probably let you talk. <laughs> oh today. no, no, this has been great. I, I've enjoyed this. Doug. Great way to kick off the week for me. Hey, so Park, so let's finish up on this because I know you have an online program that's coming out in September. So uh, what's what's the story behind it? Well, actually, not the <laughs> online program. I'm I'm just I'm working producing that. That'll probably come out the beginning of the year. Is what I'm shooting oh, for. Okay. What I've got okay. in September is another Sorry. storytelling for leaders program that I I have one underway. It's a six month deliberate practice program, and I'm launching my second one in on September seventh. And what that looks like, it's a day long immersive story training where I work with folks and really start unleashing their stories and help show them how to spot stories in the wild, capture, use them, trigger them in other people, and build a story library that they can use for any audience. And then um, every week for the next 23 weeks after that one-day session, there is a email that goes out, gives them a homework assignment. The homework takes uh, 10 to 15 minutes once a week, but it is meant to be able to be applied immediately within their business. So they're continuing to become stronger storytellers throughout. So I think that's the training you're talking about. And that kicks off September 7th here in Phoenix. That's great. And is that something that uh, that people can sign up for? Can we get a link from you? Or is Absolutely. that something that's okay? That, yep. That's great. We'll make sure a uh, nice guy community that we have a link from park and we put it in the show notes so that you can have access to the uh, to the storytelling program. That sounds like a fascinating, uh, fascinating program as well. You are a fascinating 
fascinating guest. I, I'm telling you, I have not had someone that has come on here and talked specifically. I don't think I have. I, I can recall having somebody talk about storytelling as a part of their presentation, but I don't think that we've had a an expert in the world of storytelling come on the show. So thanks, Mark, oh. for being a part of the show today. Well, my, my pleasure. And if your listeners would like to learn any more about it or, or download some tools, they can go to businessofstory.com. And Doug, I'd like to finish with this one thought. It's a thought I finish every workshop with, and I want your listeners to really take this to heart, and that is the most potent story you will ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a good one. Yeah, I love that. I love that. We will uh, we will ch- somehow try to weave that into our uh, to the title of the uh, of the episode as well. <laughs> Perfect. Hey, P- hey, Park. Thanks so much for being a part of the uh, a part of the show today. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Nice guy community. Never underestimate the power of nice. Again, special thanks to Park for being a part of our show. Park Howell. We'll make sure we put all of his information in the show notes. Steve O'Brien, go ahead and take us out of here. For the nice guys on business, I'm Steve O'Brien. Have fun storming the castle. Hello. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed Strickland. Prepare to celebrate.